Good morning, church, and welcome to Stony Creek. Welcome to the people on the video and so forth. I'm Dave Monson, liturgist for today. And are there any announcements? No? Good. Um, <laughs> I have a little report I'd like to give you about the annual conference that was held on November 30th to make up. It was about the disaffiliation with churches. And at that conference we had 66 churches asked to be disaffiliated from Heritage District. And the requirements for disaffiliation are two thirds of the congregation has to agree to it at a general conference. They have to pay two years of minister's apportionments, have to pay toward the retirement, and there's a lot of other requirements. And in Heritage District, our district, there were three churches that asked to be disqualified. Also, this ruling that they're going by is phased out as of December 31st this year. And that the next general conference, they'll have to make a new amendment or whatever to allow the new churches to fill. Also, any pastor that is with a church that decides to leave the United Methodist can has the choice of staying in the Methodist church or leaving with them. <laughs> and the other thing I want to mention is about my course that I took for living my beliefs about John Wesley and Charles Wesley. John Wesley was an amazing man. He was born 1701, I believe, and he died in 1791. He traveled 250 miles, 250,000 miles, as he toured England, Scotland, and Ireland. He preached over 7,000 sermons, and the Methodist Church, I believe, if not remembered straight, has 45 of them, which they teach to the new coming pastors. Also, his brother Charles wrote 9,000 poems, of which several of them have been put to music. And in the hymnal on page 922 at the bottom right-hand side, you'll see the hymns that are credited to Charles Wesley. Charles and John were one of 11 children, and of the 11, Ten survived to adulthood. So if you have any more questions, I'll answer later. You ready? Okay, the praise band. Take it away. see God, but Jesus Christ is exactly like him. He ranks higher than everything that has been made. Through his power all things were made. Christ himself was like God in everything, but he did not think that being equal to God was something to be used for his own benefit. But he gave up his place with God and made himself nothing. He was born to be a man and became like a servant. 
And when he was living as a man, he humbled himself and was fully obedient to God, even when that caused his death, death on a cross. So God raised him to the highest place. God made his name greater than every other name so that every knee will bow to the name of Jesus. And everyone will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and bring glory to God the Father.
Good morning. Um, today's Advent reflection is going to be the fourth Sunday of Advent. Uh, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. We give thanks for all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. The scripture lesson today is from Luke 1, 46 to 55. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of the servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him, from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their most innermost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but he has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever just as he's promised our ancestors. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Rejoice, for the gospel of the Lord has been spread and lives have been transformed. Like Mary, we praise and thank the Lord for the good news of God's reign, breaking into our broken world. When God's reign breaks in, an ordinary and powerless girl named Mary, <clears throat> excuse me, comes from the most blessed of women. God continues to do great things for all those who come with faith. God stands with the weak, lifts up the small, defends the persecuted, fills the hungry and members, remembers the forgotten. Our God values people first, no matter how miserable, lowly, and beat down they are. That gives us hope and joy as we proclaim and embody the gospel of the Lord. The gospel of the Lord has been announced to the world. We sing of God's love and his goodness, faithfulness to the people. Let us share the good news of God's reign and joy and gladness and thankfulness. Our hearts rejoice. Rejoice always, the child of light is coming. <laughs> morning offering, join Mary's great, grateful song. Our souls proclaim the greatness of the Lord, and our spirits rejoice in God, our Savior. With humble and grateful hearts, let us bring our offerings to God.
example for the doxology found on page 95 in the hymnal. Thanksgiving, Holy God, your love is magnified in the gift of your Son, whom you so freely shared with us. Bless those gifts that we offer to lift up the slowly and fill the hungry in your coming reign of justice and peace. In Christ's name, amen. Please be seated. Good morning. I'm Pastor Michael. I'm happy to see you all here on this fourth Sunday of Advent, also Christmas Eve morning. Um, thank you for, for coming out and hanging out with us today. Uh, today would be a good day to have Rudolph. Um, I was worried I wouldn't get my way back from Macon over here. Um, I was really waiting to hear some bagpipes playing, but it didn't happen. Anyway. Um, don't forget tonight, we have our Christmas Eve service at 7 o'clock. I hope you can make it. Um, and I just want to say thank you to, to all of you, um, both here and watching us online. Um, it has been quite a year in a lot of really good ways. Um, and those good ways are because of the things that you all do. So thank you. Um, I'd like to invite our children and youth to come hang out with me for a minute. What do we got? It's Christmas Eve. It is Christmas Eve, you're right. It's okay. How are you guys doing? So what else is Christmas about other than presents? Oh, I know, I know. It's um, Christmas Eve. Um, um, about family and being with your friends and family. Okay. It's about giving, loving, and you're supposed, it's, and if you like, it's not about gifts, it's about like, it's about love, and it's also about Jesus, and uh, if, and it's also about like, Oh, yeah, it's also about, like, uh, caroling, singing, stuff like that. So how does Jesus play into Christmas, Christmas Eve? What, what's Jesus' role? Because it's his birthday. It is his birthday. Tomorrow. That's right. Tomorrow morning. Wait, how old is Jesus? Yeah. 2011. 2023 years old. And it's Give or take. Um, when? When's Santa's birthday? Because I know it's today, I think. You know, I am not 100% sure when Santa's birthday is, but I can tell you that you might be able to ask him tonight. He's right over there. Shh. I already told them. I already told them. Okay, so I know you guys are all excited about presents. And love And Jesus is a present to all of us. Because he created this world, that's our present. God, God sent Jesus to save us and to teach us how to be good people. And that's a pretty important present, don't you think? Yeah. yeah. Creating stuff, creating this entire world. If we didn't have a world, if there was like no universe, we would be like pitch black. Okay. 
if you could give somebody any present, any present you could think of, what would it be and who would you give it to? <laughs> I get it, I can. Um, if I could give you any present, it would be a makeup store. <laughs> What would you give Connor then? I would give Connor every Lego I could find. Okay. <laughs> what about you? So, uh, if I like, if I was like rich, I would like. If I was very rich, I would like, um, if I was rich, I would buy, for like, my family or friends, I would buy like, uh, well, there's actually a couple things. First, can, I would can, buy, can you limit it to just one? <laughs> one gift, one person. A mission in Ferrari to my dad. Okay. So that way mom and, so that way you and mommy can like, have a cool car, and then you can like go on dates forever. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, so here's something I need you guys to do for me. The Lord's Prayer. I'm not there yet. Okay. Chill. <laughs> Chill. Just because you make, just because you go faster through things, doesn't mean time moves faster. I want you guys, because I I have a pretty good idea of what the rest of today looks like for all of you. I want you guys to make sure you give extra hugs to all of the people that you spend today with, okay? So grandmas, grandpas, moms, dads, siblings, okay? Because the best thing about today is love. AJ was right. God loved us enough to send Jesus, okay? So can you guys do that for me? Yes. You think so? God has always loved us. We'll get into that another day. Okay, well, Stop getting so deep. Okay. <laughs> Try to keep this light. <laughs> All right. Can you guys help me with the Lord's Prayer? Yeah, sure. Then we can go into deep stuff in 2036. Okay. You ready? Yeah. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, guys. You can have a sucker. You can have two suckers if you want. Really? Yeah. Because we need to get this mug empty. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's, so it's really, Christmas. it takes about a year for you to drink this much coffee? No, it takes me about five minutes. <laughs> Cass, that's why he's on, guys. He's totally on. Yeah, I could probably do it in three. Or yeah. five, or five hours. One, One, all you need is a morning to do this. But you cannot do it in a second. I know that. One second, man. I tried on a five share. I don't know if there's any more there. there you go, okay. Oof. All right. If the rest of you would rise as you are able and join in our next hymn, number 240, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. the
Now is the time that we bring before God and God's people the things that give us cause for celebration, as well as those things that may be weighing upon our hearts and our minds. Do we have any joys or concerns we'd like to lift up this morning? Uh, I have a couple of joys, and then I have one concern that I'd like to start with. Last week, we um, were told about Regina Miller's brother-in-law, Lee Miller, that he was not doing well. And yesterday, his wife took him off of life support, and he passed away this morning. So we just need to give Gina extra hugs and love and the family for what they're going through right now. And then, um, you know, with our outreach program, we not only do things with Bishop, but also with Brick and in Model with our youngest children. And we got a thank you from Model Elementary, where the littlest ones go, the four-year-olds. Uh, Charlene was busy doing hats and mittens and some little sweaters. So I delivered them over to Model, and Model said, thank you for all of the mittens, hats, and sweaters. It is so kind and thoughtful to help the children stay warm. We appreciate all of your hard work from the teachers and staff at Model Early Elementary, the GRASP and the Head Start programs. So I just, that's so cute. And then um, last week, we asked the trustees to come and meet Gilda and I after church. And we didn't get to see you, Ken. Guess what? You get to come and see Gilda and I after church. And it's not bad. Everybody's uh -huh. surprised. You're not going to get any demerits. It's fun. OK. <laughs> no. Thank you. My joy is that I'm very happy that Santa has Rudolph. With the weather tonight, I'm sure Rudolph will be able to deliver the packages. Okay. If you would please turn to number 2071 in the Faith We Sing hymnal for our invitation to prayer, Jesus, name above all names. Please join me in an attitude of prayer. Let us join our voices with Mary who celebrates God's greatness and sing of, sings of God's blessings for all who are poor and oppressed. Eternal God, we pray for the world that our warring ways may be overturned even now through the birth, death, and resurrection of Christ for nothing is impossible with you. We pray for the mission of your church, that we may proclaim the good news of the age as we rejoice in the gift of our Savior. We pray for all who suffer, that we may feed the hungry and lift up the lowly through the power of your holy and life-giving spirit. We pray for your creation, that we may safeguard its well-being from generation to generation to your honor and glory. We remember those, we remember before you those who have died 
and pray for those who will die today that they may rest with you eternally in your kingdom where there is no end. We especially lift up Lee Miller as well as Lee's family. We ask that your Holy Spirit would envelop them, help bring them comfort and strength. Help them to also know there is no right way to mourn. We do it in our own time, in our own ways. And may those loved ones around them give them the support and comfort that they are able. God, we also give you great thanks for the opportunities to share the love that you have given to us with the world, especially in our schools and our community. We thank you for being able to reach out to the ones that you reminded your disciples would inherit the kingdom of God. I ask that you help us to continue in that work as well as encourage and inspire others to continue that work even after this season of joy and giving. Through Christ, with Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, we magnify you, almighty God, forever and ever. Amen. If you would please join me in our prayer for illumination. Astonishing God, send your Holy Spirit upon us as we await the coming of your Son. Fill us with good things that we may conceive your reign on earth and glorify you according to your word. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our first scripture reading for this morning is from Psalm 89, verses 1 through 4 and 19 through 26. It's a manual of Ethan and Ern. I will sing of the Lord great love forever. With my mouth I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant, I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. Once you spoke in a vision to your people, you said, I have bestowed strength on the warriors. I have raised up a young man from among the people. I have found David, my servant, with my sacred oil. I have anointed him. My hand will sustain him surely. My arms will strengthen him. The enemy will not get the advantages. My father, my faithful love will be with him and through his name. His horn will be exalt, exalted. I will set his hand over the sea and his right hand over the river. He will call out to me, you, have, you are my father, my God, the rock of my salvation. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Now, if you are able, would you just please stand and join us in hymn. There's a song in the air, page 249 in the hymnal.
be seated. Our second scripture reading for this morning can be found beginning on page 301. We are in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 11, and then verse 16. This section of text often carries the header, God's promise to David. After the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. But that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites out, up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all of your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may have a home of their own, and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them any more, as they did in the beginning, and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. If you'd please join me once again in an attitude of prayer. God of mercy, grace, redemption, and love, you are everywhere in this world. You exist in every corner of your creation, in every crevice and open field, and in the hearts of your children. We ask that you might help us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the love of Jesus Christ. Help us to never try and restrict you to one place in this world and to instead see your movement and feel your presence everywhere we go. And now may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts together in this place be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So just where is home anyway? According to Dr. Brewster M. Higley of Smith County, Kansas, home is on the range. His poem, My Western Home, written somewhere around 1871, 72, 73, somewhere in there, eventually became a song. And on June 13th, 1947, Home on the Range became the Kansas state song. In 2010, members of the Western Writers of America chose it as one of the top 100 Western songs of all time. I bring this all up because past couple weeks we've been talking about home, and a couple weeks ago we were talking about wilderness and our, our wilderness experiences. And, and this song is about an area of space that I think many people at the time considered to be wilderness, and many still do to this day. You may remember that I mentioned that God knows our wilderness experiences because God has been with us, even in the wilderness, physical or otherwise. So I guess even the range can be home for God or man, not me. Throughout this Advent and Christmas season, we've been, we've been talking about the different ways that we define the term home. And we've also been kind of exploring the question of where do we belong? And we've already acknowledged that the answers 
to the questions of where do we belong, how do we define or understand home, they can vary drastically, wildly from person to person, and even change over time for individuals as life moves on. Now, I can easily say for myself that how I have thought about the word home has changed several times throughout my life, usually around the time that my physical living location changed or who I was sharing that space with. As a child, home was where my parents and my sisters were and where our extended family often gathered for parties, celebrations. It was always kind of the place to be. When I moved out on my own, the apartment, first apartment I lived in, it never quite felt like home. Definitely not that first idea of home that I had. And the more I've thought about it, I don't think any place I have lived felt like home for me again until it was somewhere that I shared with Sarah and then that grew even stronger once the boys came into our lives. And as I think back to how that feeling changed for me, I believe a big part of that was because home, at, at least for me, home is the place where I feel comfortable. When I lived by myself, I never felt all that comfortable. I missed being with the people I loved and the people who loved me. I felt kind of isolated. But I also acknowledged that maybe by living alone for a time, maybe I came to appreciate that much more the time living with those that I love. Now, I really, really believe that home should be somewhere that we feel comfortable and safe. The truth, though, is that we know that's not a reality for everyone. People whose homes have been devastated or just even located in war zones and continued violence, they may not feel all that comfortable at home. Although even in the midst of that horror, maybe for some home is that last bastion of comfort that they can find. Kind of depends on a lot of different factors, I think. For people who are victims and witnesses to domestic violence, home might be anything but comfortable. Families who have struggled, or who have someone who is struggling with addiction, a loved one fighting a life-threatening illness, all of those realities potentially could make home not such a comfortable place, unfortunately. But I do still believe in a perfect world that home should be somewhere we feel comfortable. That place where you can kick off your shoes, Put your feet up on the coffee table, or maybe not, depending on who else lives in your home and what rules you've established. And it's also the place where you can be your whole and full entire self. Home should be that place where you know where things are, or maybe not, depending on your organizational skills and how much value you place on that. I think almost every house has a junk drawer somewhere. We've got at least one, maybe more. But, but sometimes the emotional place of home can be kind of elusive. Home can be that, that mythical land like in dreams and fairy tales. And as I've been thinking about this elusive definition of a, a full concept of physical, emotional, spiritual, and psychological home, it's made me think of the people who have formed and shaped us to be who we are today. Now, I will admit that when I think about this fourth Sunday of Advent, I can't help but think of home. And, and I even long for that place 
to fully and wholly and truly be the place where we can become the people God created us to be. You see, this is the time of year where, where many of us plan to return to the places and the people that have helped form us. In many cases, those places and people are where we can just simply be without having to fully explain ourselves just be. In other cases, though, it can also be the complete opposite. It can be a reality where going back to those places and those people that formed us can actually give us anxiety and cause stress because they weren't places we felt we could just simply be. They weren't places where we felt we could get away with not explaining ourselves. Going home for the holidays, unfortunately, is not always a pleasant or joyful experience for some people. Again, in a perfect world, it would be. With all this talk of home these past few weeks, I found myself several times thinking about God's home. I mean, because really, where does God live? Up in the clouds? That's how Tom and Jerry shows it. In heaven, everywhere. When we look at our second reading this morning from the Old Testament scripture of 2 Samuel, King David is convinced that God needs a better home than a tent. Now, I will admit, I cannot blame King David too much here, at least personally. I mean, everyone deserves a better home than a tent, in my opinion. But enough about how much I despise camping. You all know that. So yeah, King David, he's just so sure in his mind that God needs a home that is vastly superior to some tent. And God, he tells David, oh, thank you so much. I was getting really tired of the drafts at night and, and not having solid walls around me. Uh, no, not exactly. <clears throat> Instead, God kind of confronts David and says, uh, excuse me, all this time you've been carting me around in this tent, have I ever asked or demanded that you make me a house of cedar? No. I wonder sometimes if this interaction wouldn't have made for a great episode of Property Brothers or House Hunters. But it seems that God's all right with where God is, being around God's people. God delights in being around God's people. God even tells David, I've been with you wherever you went. God didn't want the people to forget that God was always with them. God did not want the people to, to try and restrict their relationship with God to, to some building that it would be the only place that they would encounter God. Because God's everywhere. Always has been. There's nowhere in this world that God has not already been and that God does not continue to be. What happens next in our story, it really fits into this idea of God as the God of reversals and surprises. God likes to flip the script a lot of times, we see throughout scripture, and God tells David, hey, I will build you a home for you and your people, and I will establish a dynasty. A dynasty. Let's be completely honest here. This, this isn't just a simple promise, at least not to David and the people. This is a significant proclamation coming from God because this is to a people who have lived with displacement. They have a history of wandering, including a good 40 years in the desert or wilderness. So having this home, this is paramount for these people. This is a big deal. One of the things that I think Advent does, or at least can do, 
especially with the readings for this year, is that Advent reminds us that we are all sojourners. We are all looking for God's kingdom to come, that that complete fullness of whatever home is, where we can wholly and fully and entirely be ourselves. Advent reminds us of our sojourn. Advent reminds us that we are living in in between times. This season of anticipation reminds us that the fulfillment of the place that we can call home is coming not just with the Christ child, but with the second coming of Christ. The season of Advent and the seasons of Lent and Easter, they're they're so intertwined in so many ways, but but I think a lot of times we, we tend to think about them just as separate things, partially because of the separation of time in our calendar and time in history that they occur. But the truth is there is so much that pulls them together. Something else I want to point out is that King David was able to accept this promise and gift from God. And I say was able because I think there are a lot of us who struggle to accept things like gifts, compliments, even encouragement. But David was able to accept this gift. And God offers us salvation and grace through the sacrifice of Jesus, but we still need to accept those gifts. I wonder sometimes how many of our struggles or or challenging times ultimately are, are due to our inability to accept the things that God is trying to give us. The words of a former district superintendent continue to live with me at a charge conference several years ago. He said to the leadership of one of the churches I was serving, sometimes you need to be willing to give up a gift from God to receive an even greater gift from God. And whether we feel unworthy or have some other negative view of ourselves, God doesn't see us that way. God loves us, all of us. And really, that's the first thing that we really, really need to work on to accept. Because until we do, we're kind of stuck. But when we do, then we are able to move forward in receiving the other blessings and gifts that God holds for us. Christianity is not a spectator sport. There is action required of us. I think about King David getting to share that news with the people. They were going to have a home. After so many generations and all that time just wandering, waiting and hoping, they were finally going to get to see home. And I think at least for me, this, this kind of season, this time of year, in addition to things like family, the other thing that really makes this world home is the fact that God became flesh and entered into it with us. Because we know no matter what, God is always with us. God will not abandon us. And that brings some comfort. Amen. Really quickly before our final hymn, again, just a reminder, 7 o'clock this evening, if you are able to join us, whether in person or online. Um, And please, please, please be careful as you're driving. I don't know if the fog's lifted yet, but I want to keep everybody safe and healthy. 
I will be out of town the 27th through the 31st, and I'll send an email with this info too. And then the 4th through the 7th, or 3rd, I think it's 4th through the 7th. If there are any pastoral emergencies, please contact me like you normally would. Um, if it's something really serious, I'm only going to be a few hours away in Chicago. Um, but hopefully there won't be anything serious. Um, and if anybody's thinking of having anything serious, tell me now because you can order a giant thing of bubble wrap about this big that looks like some of those hay bales out in the fields and we'll just wrap everybody in bubble wrap. So, anywho, if you would rise as you are able for our closing hymn number 237, Sing We Now of Christmas, verses 1 through 3. Beloved children of God, siblings in Christ Jesus, do not be afraid, for God is with you and will strengthen you in your journey through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. And now we are called to magnify the Lord and rejoice, for nothing, nothing is impossible with God. And may the blessing of God who creates, redeems, and restores be with you now and always. Go forth, serve the Lord in peace, Love your neighbors as yourselves. Welcome in the coming of our Savior. Amen. Mm -hmm.